Hello and welcome to another set of videos from Mr. Exum. This time I'm going to be talking to you about photosynthesis. Now, when I was growing up learning about biology, I didn't really find plants that interesting. I was much more interested in learning about humans. But I'm a bit of a plant convert now. And that's because they are amazing organisms. Not only do they give us the oxygen in our atmosphere, which is obviously very, very useful, but they also provide the energy for the majority of our ecosystems. And that's because plants can do this incredible process called photosynthesis. So, in photosynthesis, plants can take the energy from the sun and convert it into glucose. And they do that using chlorophyll, which is found inside their chloroplasts. And a typical plant cell has about between 10 and 50 of these chloroplast organelles. We're going to review the structure of them in the next video on photosynthesis. Now, what you should know about photosynthesis so far is that you take carbon dioxide and you take water, two particularly sort of abundant molecules that you can find quite readily in the atmosphere, uh, and actually combine those using chlorophyll and the sun's energy to make glucose and oxygen. But what you probably didn't know is that chlorophyll is actually a mixture of closely related pigments. You can split it up into chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, a group of pigments called carotenoids, uh, and pheophytin. You can actually do this in a, a practical, there's probably a practical you'll be doing in class, um, using chromatography, maybe thin paper chromatography, where you take a plant, maybe a nettle, and you grind it up in a pestle and mortar, and add um, some maybe some propanone, which will extract all the pigments from the, the chloroplasts, you put a dot of that on the bottom of your uh, chromatography paper, and then you suspend it in some solvent. And what will happen over time is that solvent will travel up the uh, chromatography paper, and it will split out and separate into the different pigments. And you'll be able to see the different colors of these little individual pigments that make up what we refer to in general as chlorophyll. Now what you can do uh, when you finish your chromatography is you can work out something called an RF value for each pigment. Um, it'll be somewhere between 0 and 1, and all you need to do is measure with a ruler uh, the distance moved by the compound and also the distance moved by the solvent. You can then just put it into this very simple equation, and that may well help you identify what that pigment was once you have the RF value. So chlorophyll A is actually the most abundant and is found in all photosynthesizing plants, but other plants vary hugely, and that's why you get such an incredible array of different variations in leaf color in nature, because of the different combinations of pigments they have in their leaves. So how does chlorophyll work? Well, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, which you may have done in, in physics um, before, you will know that the visible light spectrum is somewhere between 400 and 700 nanometers. Now plants actually use that same range for photosynthesis. So the light that we see with our eyes, our visible uh, light um, that, we can use, that we can detect in our eyes, is actually the same um, spectrum of light that um, plants can use to detect in their leaves for photosynthesis. Different pigments in the chlorophyll will absorb different wavelengths between that range of 400 and 700 nanometers. And actually, you can look at an absorption spectrum for each individual pigment. Here is a graph, or an absorption spectrum graph, showing you uh, the absorption for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. As you can see, chlorophyll A is, absorbs really highly in the, um, in the blue and the red range, but not in the green at all. Um, chlorophyll B absorbs a little bit more towards the um, green range, um, but it's still more in the blue section. And when you look at them together, you can see that right in the middle of the green and the yellow section, there is very little absorption between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. That's why actually, if you uh, look at, think about it, leaves are actually green. If you shine light on a leaf, all the red light and the blue light gets absorbed 
by these pigments and it is the green light that is not particularly well absorbed by the range of pigments found in a typical leaf and it is that light that gets reflected and that's why all the leaves look green. You can also look at something called the action spectrum. Now the action spectrum shows you how fast a plant is photosynthesizing at different uh, wavelengths of light. And unsurprisingly there is a pattern uh, or a correlation between this and the absorption spectrum of these pigments where you've got most of the absorption again between 400 and 500 nanometers um, by mostly chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B and some of these carotenoids uh, you get a very high rate of photosynthesis. In the, in the green range where they're not absorbing much light the range of photosynthesis is very low. And another practical you may have to do is look at the uh, difference in wavelengths and how that affects rate of photosynthesis. You could take some pondweed, for example, and put it in a beaker of water, and uh, you can measure how much oxygen it produces as, a, as an indication of how fast it's photosynthesizing. And if you, if you collect the, the volume of that oxygen in a given time, that will give you a rate. And what you can then do is change the wavelength of that light by putting different filters over the color of the lamp. Be careful to make sure that all the other variables that need to be controlled, such as carbon dioxide levels in the water um, and the distance of the uh, light from the, the plant and the temperature, for example, are all kept constant to make it uh, a valid uh, experiment.